Good morning, everyone. This is John Kogan. I'm the CEO of Performative, the online community for corporate finance, accounting, treasury, and related professionals. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is a live technology demo uh, uh, focused on how NetSuite streamlines the order to cash process. Most people in finance and accounting have heard about NetSuite, the leading cloud-based financial management system. But until you see it in action, it's hard to put the functionality in perspective and understand how your company might benefit from it. Today, we'll get you up to speed on the leading cloud financial management system while you see it in action. Before we get into that, a couple of quick items. First off, welcome to Performative. Performative is the largest and fastest growing online resource for senior corporate finance, treasury, accounting, and related professionals. Uh, we're an online community where folks get on and ask questions of their peers and their peers answer questions, all in a noise-free environment and all completely free. Uh, so no membership required, no fee for anything. Uh, it's just a great community of peers who are there to help one another out. Great resource. Check it out at performative.com. A few notes on this morning's event. Uh, of course, a welcome to everyone attending. We uh, greatly thank you for giving us this hour. Um, a link to today's presentation and a link to the video of this webinar will be sent out to all attendees within 24 hours. And this morning's presentation is already posted at performative.com slash resources. Uh, so you can go there and grab it right now if you'd like to follow along at home, um, make notes, etc. Um, it's out there, it's ready uh, and available for you. Uh, just a quick reminder, there is no CPE uh, credit for this morning's webinar. Um, this is a demo webinar, not one of our uh, typical educational webinars, so just uh, to remind folks. Uh, please ask questions on today's topic via the questions box in your GoToWebinar control panel. If you take a quick look at that control panel, you'll see there's a little section there called questions. It might be collapsed um, with a plus next to it. You just hit that plus. There's a little area in which you can ask questions. It's quick and easy, and we'll do our best to get to all questions today. Uh, now, the way today's event is going to roll out is after I'm done with my brief intro here, uh, we'll introduce the, uh, today's two speakers, and we'll let them go at it. There's going to be about 15 to 20 minutes worth of presentation uh, talking about um, the NetSuite platform, and then um, we will get into the NetSuite demo. Uh, so uh, following the demo, we will get to the Q&A. So if you have any questions at all, we'll, uh, we'll do our best to get to them during the Q&A segment, which will be the last section of today's event. Finally. You will be asked to take a short survey today regarding the webinar. Uh, we're always trying to improve. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, we would love to hear from you and um, know what we can do better the next time. We always want to be getting better here at Performance, so your feedback is appreciated. Plus, in that survey, if you would like to be connected with either of today's speakers or someone else at NetSuite, uh, we make it very easy for you to request that. You simply uh, click the mouse um, in that section of the survey, and we'll be more than happy to uh, help out with that introduction. Uh, so that's uh, a little bit about today's event, and now let's go ahead and get on to today's main event. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce both speakers right now, so we can go uninterrupted through um, the uh, presentation that we'll see shortly. First up is Robert Israel. Robert is a senior director at NetSuite, and he brings over 10 years experience focusing on business management technology and software, including financial management, CRM, ERP, supply chain, e-commerce, and project management. Robert is currently a senior director at NetSuite, managing international markets and global programs. Prior to NetSuite, he worked at both Intuit and GE. Robert is an experienced strategist with expertise in helping businesses achieve and manage rapid growth. Also joining us this morning is Fran Delaney, who is a senior solution consultant at NetSuite. Uh, he is a senior solution consultant and software vertical market expert, specializing in revenue recognition and global consolidation issues. Fran started his career in corporate finance and accounting for a number of corporations based on the East Coast. Since moving to the Bay Area in 1997, Fran has worked in various positions in the software industry at Oracle Corporation and within the Microsoft channel prior to joining NetSuite in 2010. Fran has a BS in accounting from the University of Connecticut. And with that, I'd like to hand the reins over to Robert Isrock and uh, say thank you very much for coming in this morning, Robert. Hi, guys. 
Um, so thank you for joining the webinar with us. And so to kick it off, you know, before we talk a little bit about NetSuite, I wanted to kind of give you a little background of the marketplace, and that really kind of explains what NetSuite's uh, story and reason for existing is all about. Um, so, you know, if you look at the marketplace in particular, most companies are using on-premise software uh, to run most of their business, uh, in particular accounting. Uh, many companies using systems like Microsoft Great Plains, QuickBooks, Sage, um, and other systems out there like SAP and Oracle and the such. Um, and so what's happened in the marketplace and a lot of this um, momentum you hear about the cloud, the reason that's happening is because of, you know, you can see some of the data out there talking to this, but the cost of maintaining an on-premise system oftentimes uh, costs over five times the cost of the actual license itself. Um, with the servers, the hardware, software backups, upgrades, and all the maintenance that goes with it. And companies have, have gotten frustrated with that time waste that comes with that. Um, similarly, uh, and for the same reason uh, around this maintenance, a lot of companies are staying on their old version of software, so they're not taking advantage of um, new versions and upgraded technology and uh, features because of the pain that comes with uh, upgrading a software across all your different offices and your computers and the such. And therefore, they're using older technology oftentimes, particularly in the accounting field, isn't keeping up with regulatory changes and, and important uh, aspects of your business that can help with uh, improved processes and efficiencies. Um, and for that same reason, uh, the IT departments oftentimes aren't able to spend their time on innovation. Um, data from Gardner shows that only 9% of an IT team's time and money is spent on innovation these days because they're really focused on maintaining the current architectures they have in place, um, which, you know, oftentimes is really because of a fragmented uh, system. One is because on-premise systems, another piece of it is oftentimes companies, they'll have QuickBooks or Great Plains for accounting perhaps, Excel tied throughout the whole process is in the middle, oftentimes Excel for inventory and fulfillment, but sometimes other systems managing on that side of the place another system for CRM, maybe another system for marketing, another system for the web perhaps, or custom coding for the web. Um, and all these, these systems are being tied together in time. Additional time on top of maintaining your on-premise software is being spent integrating or trying to tie reports together from these various systems. Um, and that, those four real drivers kind of led to when, uh, when NetSuite got started. And so the goal of NetSuite really is to um, create a web-based integrated business system that powers companies, but at the fraction of the cost and complexity that traditional on-premise software uh, typically costs at companies. Um, and in particular, this is relevant to SMBs and mid-sized companies, fast-growing businesses, who are really, you know, they, they have some of the same requirements that a large business have, but they don't have endless budget and resources like a large enterprise may. Um, and they, they, they need a different system to enable them to move faster. So a little background on NetSuite. Um, company was founded in 1998. Um, it was founded by Larry Ellison, who you may know from Oracle, as well as another key engineering executive from Oracle. Um, it's public trade on the New York Stock Exchange. We now operate in 10 countries um, with 1,300 employees around the world. Um, and we're approaching 300 million in, uh, in total revenue uh, for the year of uh, 2012. Um, the company, uh, NetSuite, is the world's most deployed cloud ERP system out there. Over 12,000 plus organizations use it. Um, and Gardner's called it the, for the last three years, has rated it as the fastest growing top 10 ERP system um, in the world. Um, actually, the ERP, it's really financial management system that was rated as the top, fastest growing top 10 financial management system in the world. And we have customers in over 100 countries um, around the world. The system is very strong on a multi-country uh, basis, as Fran will talk to in a few minutes. Um, uh, customers, large and small, use it. You know, companies like Jawbone, Splunk, um, and GoPro, fast-growing companies, as well as large companies like CA, Johnson & Johnson, Lando Lakes, Procter & Gamble. Um, so large and small companies um, are utilizing the system in differing ways. Um, and, you know, as I've mentioned, um, you know, along with our growth, a lot of industry recognition. This talks to um, uh, some of the statistics around 
Uh, the gardeners noted us as the fa fastest growing top 10 financial management system. It's for the last three years running. It's also interesting to note that uh, it's the only system in Gardner's top 10 financial management that's 100% cloud. All the other systems in that, in that uh, top 10 are on-premise primarily. And, you know, we've had industry recognition from companies like Gartner basically calling us the leader in the SaaS ERP market. So the way NetSuite's been designed is all around improvement in business processes. And Franz Demo will talk to this and show this in more detail. But at a high level, the system hasn't been designed as just your siloed system, a simple bookkeeping system. It's been designed a, around the financial processes. And what are those financial processes that cause pain, um, cause, cause frustration to a financial executive? Um, and oftentimes, it's not only the GAAP accounting book that, uh, that this relates to. It relates to your reporting ability, uh, inventory management, fulfillment management, billing, payroll, revenue recognition, time and expense, PO systems. Um, and so the whole process has been streamlined through NetSuite from quote to order, plan to build, procure to play, project to bill, um, and in addition to global company management. And so the system has been designed that. And so oftentimes the system is looked at as more of a financial suite in that it breaks down walls they're typically there between various financial systems that companies use, including Excel, of course. One of the strengths of NetSuite is that the system's been built on top of a global business management system that includes multi-currency, multi-country, multi-language, multi-taxation, multi-regulatory capabilities built into the system. So if you're a company that's considering or currently working on a global basis, um, the system's particularly strong um, in that basis. And the fact that it's cloud-based is particularly useful when you're opening up new offices or you have different offices um, around the world and around the country. In fact, a lot of the large customers that we talked about on the previous slide, the way they're using NetSuite is in these international offices they have to help them expand globally and operate more quickly and efficiently. Um, this is a little bit of data in terms of why uh, many companies are moving from on-premise to the cloud. Essentially, uh, Hurwitz & Associates, a respected analyst in the industry, has shown through analysis that uh, a cloud business suite gets you 50% reduction in total cost of ownership over a four-year basis. And the reason is that the cost really isn't in licenses alone. The cost is in maintenance, upgrades, IT resource time, patches, infrastructure and requirements. Um, and that's where you get huge cost savings um, with the cloud. And essentially what that means is your IT resource and your team can start focusing on innovation and growth rather than simply maintaining the way the company runs today. Sorry, having some slide issues here. A little bit more on the cloud outside of the total cost of ownership. Total cost of ownership is one benefit of the cloud for sure and the reduction in maintenance. There are, of course, other benefits. When we talk to our customers, a lot of them talk about the anytime, anywhere access to the system. Um, all the, you know, with the cloud, every piece of data in their system is real time. It's pulling from the system as you speak. So as soon as you load a dashboard, that data is, uh, is exactly how it is in the system. Um, so self-service reporting, personalized reporting, ability to access from anywhere, um, real time data are all key components. Um, tied to that is mobility. You know, with distributed workforces, multi-location offices, outsourcing to different countries and different regions of America, um, and other types of uh, changes that are happening in the business world, mobility is particularly important, and the cloud is basically made for that. You know, you can use any type of uh, web device, any, types of any type of browser, essentially access the system from anywhere. Um, and because it's web-based, it happens to be much easier to use from a self-service perspective for not only your employees, but customers and vendors. Um, it's expandable beyond your borders. You know, and related to this, we've, uh, there's a, a number of studies that we've, uh, that we've uh, run to identify the, the benefit that NetSuite provides, both with a integra fully integrated multi-process system as well as a cloud-based architecture. And, and the results are pretty, uh, are pretty profound in terms of 
oftentimes the businesses uh, on average are able to reduce their financial close time from 20 to 50 percent. Um, a lot of that is eliminating Excel and uh, integrating data from multiple systems and offices. Um, reduction in invoicing costs. Um, improvement in ability to collect quickly. Um, and quote to cash processes, which are particularly time uh, intensive. Um, the cycle time is reduced to over 50% oftentimes. Improvement in sales productivity by having CRM tied to accounting and having accounting with the ability to see what's happening from an order management perspective. And of course, the, what we talked about already with the, the total cost ownership regarding on-premise versus the cloud. So uh, at this point, I've given you a good overview of NetSuite at a high level. Uh, Fran's going to take it from here and really give you a, a deeper view of how the, comp how the system works from a multi-country perspective and then go into a deep demo. Um, and so I'm going to pass it over to Fran Delaney and uh, he'll take it from here. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Hey, before we jump into the live demo, I just wanted to, to give you a brief overview of, of what we're going to do for the next few minutes. One of the things with NetSuite is the, the initial experience on NetSuite is dashboard based. So depending on what your job function is, you'll have a unique dashboard which can have a variety of elements that are most important to that individual. So if you're in more of an administrative role, things like entering journal entries or entering AP invoices will dominate that dashboard. If you're a, a senior executive role and maybe what you're more interested in is more strategic information, so things like trend reporting or key performance indicators or statistical indicators important enough to your company, that will be driven onto your individual dashboard as that executive. Um, a lot of the emerging companies we work with have a blend of that. They, they have executives that actually roll up their sleeves and, and, and actually do transactional work. So again, as part of these dashboards, um, depending on what your job function is and your everyday job role, can have a, a plethora of, of different functions, ranging from doing transactional data all the way up to in, in including trend reporting and in, in key performance indicators. Okay, next slide, please, Rob. Hey, Rob, could you switch to the next slide, please? Yeah, I'm trying. Okay, should be coming up shortly. There we okay. go. Okay. Um, Oops, back one, please. Okay, so the demonstration environment that I'm in is, is a multinational corporation, okay? Um, and as Rob mentioned, initially I'm going to start off as the CFO of a global organization with headquarters in the U.S. Um, from then I'm going to go down to a, a subsidiary in the U.S. just to show you some of the transactional information. But the takeaway from NetSuite's structure here is that it can be a multi-level, multinational roll-up. Um, with all of the appropriate localizations and currency support that you would expect from a global organization. As part of the, the transactional information, we'll focus on, on more um, information based in one of the subsidiaries. So again, um, whether your business is a global f business or maybe a smaller emerging business you know, with, with aspirations of going global, that information can be supported within NetSuite from both ends. Next slide, please, Rob. Okay. From a currency perspective, NetSuite today supports 190 currencies, effectively every currency known to man. As new currencies come into play, they'll be fully supported within NetSuite so that you know, companies that might be based in the U.S., for example, can transact in um, you know, companies across the globe. So whether it's in Asia Pac or Europe or, or even Canada or Mexico, um, NetSuite supports full currency functionality both from a transactional basis as well as things like global consolidations. Um, we're FASB 52 compliant, so as far as consolidations, one of the unique things within NetSuite is that there's a real-time roll-up taking into account um, you know, currency exchange rates that are resident within the NetSuite system. Okay, next slide please, Rob. Okay, from a localization perspective as far as tax reporting, today NetSuite directly supports 42 different countries, okay, on this list. There's a number of additional countries that we can support, and again, um, as people do, um, you know, expansion across the globe, this list will be in increasing. But even if there's, you're doing business and you have a subsidiary based in a country that's not on this list, 
It doesn't mean it's not supported by NetSuite. It just makes sense that we have certain partners in area, various areas across the globe that those partners will supply the, the tax reporting and tax localization structures. So things like tax tables, certain regulatory requirements specific to certain countries, if they're not on this list, will be supported by partners. Okay. And then next slide, Rob. Okay. Today, NetSuite, again, with an with a ever-increasing list, supports 18 different languages. Okay. And again, this is not specific to country or subsidiary. Um, I live in the Bay Area where it's a very diverse environment. If individuals are more com are, um, comfortable in their home language, you know, just from a, a flick of a button on an individual basis, people can look at all the forums resident in NetSuite in their native language. So again, if somebody was in the Bay Area but was more comfortable looking at the forums in Chinese, um, that's fully supported. And again, uh, that's up to and including the double byte languages as well. And again, that will all be in a single database as opposed to um, having to do multiple databases specifically for that double byte, byte language character set. Okay. Um, now, with that said, maybe we'll stop with the PowerPoint and actually jump into a live demo. All right, I'm going to go ahead and change presenter here and hand it over to Fran. Okay. And just before we start here, just to make sure we don't do a faux pas, can, John, can you confirm, can you see my um, screen? I can see it on my screen. Okay, great. All right, one of the things, a couple things before we start to note about NetSuite. We are completely browser-based. So if you have internet access and the appropriate credentials supplied by your administrative um, team within your company, you can access NetSuite. Okay? Um, we're browser agnostic, so again, I'm an internet explorer right now, but if you happen to be partial to Firefox or Google Chrome or, or even if you're an Apple aficionado and prefer Safari, um, again, any browser will give you access into NetSuite again with those appropriate credentials. Okay? From a security vantage point, there's 128-bit data encryption. It suffice it to say, that's the same type of security that your online bank account would be. Okay, so if you're with Bank of America, for example, and have an online bank account, um, that's the same security that you'll get over the web. Okay, NetSuite is role-based. So you'll notice if I hover over the upper right-hand corner, I'm signed on as a CFO of a global organization. But again, depending on what your job function is, we can limit access to various components. Um, so you'll notice later on I'm going to go into a controller role just for a single subsidiary. There's a lightweight employee functionality, which again, think of things like expense reports or entering uh, purchase requests, maybe some light HR functionality along the lines of you know, changes of address or marital status. All of these are the various roles that are supplied by NetSuite that will enable you to you know, roll this out with a minimum of, of data in infrastructure. Okay, that's all handled by NetSuite. All right? In this one particular role, again, as a global CFO, I'm looking at a global organization with operations in both um, North America as well as Asia, PAC, and Europe. You'll notice things like the top five customers globally. I actually have a graphical presentation here on the right of what customers have. There's date ranges, so for this particular case, I have this month, but I can look for it over rolling years, week to date, year to date, and so on. And again, it's just from a, the drop of a button. If I wanted to look at this maybe with a pie chart versus the, the org structure that I was looking at previously, again, very easily done. And then while these graphical presentations are important to some folks, maybe some people are more you know, interested in just transactional information. I can actually free up that real estate by just hiding some of these fields. So I have a couple of these graphical presentations that I want. Maybe if I don't want to see them, I can remove them. If I ever want to go back out, one of the real strengths of NetSuite is adding those information, that type of information back to this dashboard is easily done with you know, using a, what we call click not code at NetSuite. So again, I can pull those graphical representations back very easily just by grabbing the customers by balance and customers by sales, pulling it back there. That real estate also can be handled just by a drag and drop capability. Okay, so again, as far as setting all of this information up, very easily done, doesn't, isn't going to require IT intervention. It's just the one thing to take away from this, though, is if there's a certain amount of control that your company wants to have, um, it can be limited what the individual can do. 
certain things that are available on a real-time basis within NetSuite. Um, there's global financial ratios, so things like the traditional current ratios or, or DSO calculations. Those are real-time rolling up into this information. And then even if you just look at it on this DSO calculation, if I click on this button, it'll actually tell me where that calculation is coming from. So it's looking at sales divided by receivables, and then the period of experience that we're looking at in this particular case is 30 days. So you can tell um, as part of all of this information, if you wanted to drill down and see the appropriate sales or receivable capability, you can do that as well. Okay. Um, from a menu vantage point, I mentioned previously that you know maybe in some of these emerging companies, the CFO might actually be looking at things like income statements, balance sheets, but they may also want to you know occasionally have to go in and you know enter a transaction system. From a menu base, you can actually go out here and enter things like sales orders or create sales invoices. If that's something that the individual is going to frequently do, they can actually do that from a menu or save it from a, a shortcut menu. Okay. Very powerful here as far as what people can do and access it as, as easily as they'd like. Um, one other thing, at NetSuite we try to use the system to actually get you information after it's happened, but we also like to use the, the power of the system to proactively notify you of events coming into play. So various things like expense reports that may need to be approved. Again, the system can proactively remind you that that has to happen. Um, Maybe you want to keep an eye on intercompany journals. You know, a global CFO on occasion might have to play referee, um, you know, between the various country managers. In this particular case, if there's intercompany transfers, um, we have a powerful workflow engine that can drive an approval process across the board. So in this particular case, the system, again, is going to proactively notify me as this CFO that I can actually go out and um, approve these transfers between the various subsidiaries. And last but not least on this dashboard is there's key performance indicators. NetSuite delivers approximately 75 key performance indicators out of the box, but if there's something unique to your business that you'd like to have pushed out on this dashboard, it's it very easily done through a query function that we have. You'll notice there's a couple things here that may be valuable to a CFO of this global organization. So things like sales from an order vantage point, okay, or 8 million six for this particular month, an improvement over the previous month. Again, this is non uh, P&L perspective for the financial folks out there. You know, more of a CRM perspective. New customers that have been added. From a P&L perspective, we have revenue, expenses, and profit like you'd see from a traditional um, uh, P&L as well as looking at things like you know, a cash balance, you know, ongoing receivables, payables. All of this information is real time. And you'll notice some of this information is bolded with flags. Okay, when I hover over that, basically I've set up a threshold from my basis as a CFO that it's great news that our income for the month is, is roughly 68% above the previous month. But before I run to my board of directors or venture capitalists or anybody like that, maybe I want the ability to drill down and see what's, where that number has come from. Okay? So you do have drill down capability from here. So I'm going to actually drill down. It's going to look like a traditional income statement. So I'll look at revenues. We'll have some cost of goods sold as well as some administrative functions here. Okay? Very easy if I want to collapse that and look at it more of a summary fashion. I have that ability or I can actually look at it in as much detail as I'd like to see, again, within the confines of the credentials that you know, have been given to me. Typically, as a CFO of a global corporation, I can get whatever I want. But again, the idea here is, is um, while I'm in a demonstration environment and can see pretty much anything I'd like, um, just note that from a visibility vantage point, you can limit what people can see. Um, as well as what they can do out there. So whether they can enter transactions or maybe just view or modify previously entered transactions, that can be done as well. NetSuite, we do things online, but we also understand that the capabilities are necessitated that um, we want to sit there and have that ability to push things out to things like Excel or Word. So all of this information can be pushed out. When it's pushed out to Excel, all of the calculations, so the, the calculations for revenue, for example, that are the totals here, that actually gets pushed out to Excel as well. Okay? Now, being that this is a global organization, you also have the ability, the ability to look at this across a, a different vantage point. So I'm actually going to filter this based on the subsidiary hierarchy and then refresh this screen. 
Okay. Now what this is going to do now is give me the ability, when I showed you that um, org structure a little bit earlier, you'll notice that we have headquarters, but then we have subsidiaries. So the Americas is a, a parent organization to Canada, U.S. East and U.S. West. There's a parent for the Asia Pac, which in this case has Australia and Japan as subsidiaries, as well as EMEA, which in this case has Germany in the U.K. You still have the ability from here now to look across this global organization, but also from here you can actually drill down. So I'm going to actually drill down, still as a global CFO, and look down and say, okay, that $136,000 of revenue is made up of two transactions, a, a journal entry, which might have been a transfer from another organization, as well as an invoice from a company called the Gabriel Solutions. Now, since I drill down into the UK, this is still in US dollars, but if I want to look at it from a vantage point of the UK, I can again filter from here, refresh this screen, and that $96,000 is now going to be looking at 60,000 British pounds. That's taken advantage of the exchange rates that are built into the system. And again, if I want to drill down even further, I can actually get down to the source transaction here. So you'll notice I've drilled down. I'm actually at an invoice for Gabriel Solutions. You'll notice when I scroll down, the currency that we're now in is British pounds. The subsidiary that we've drilled down to is now in the United Kingdom, as well as looking in this particular case, it's a software company. So there's some uh, software license being sold as well as support contract. And then you'll notice here even is a support contract in this particular case is going to traditionally have revenue recognition recognized over time. So while a, a support license might be recognized immediately from a revenue recognition vantage point. This is going to be recognized over time, and then you have the ability to look at that piece. You'll also notice from a tax perspective, um, since we're in the UK, they're applicable to VAT codes um, over in Europe. So again, for that vantage point, these tax rates are installed in the system, and again, automatically based on various uh, topics that you set up will actually drive the applicable tax code as well. As part of this, I'm going to actually drill down now even to this customer record. And you'll notice from that global perspective, I can actually drill down. I don't have to run reports. I don't have to open up different applications or different screens. I can just drill down. I can see things like a customer record. So if I want to look at various demographics as far as um, the sales rep assigned to this particular company, different information as far as where they're based, how their actually transactions are pushed out to them. So you know, traditionally, we can send paper invoices. But if you'd prefer to send it electronically through an email, that's supported. And then even look at various information from sales perspective, financials perspective. You want to look at um, you know, things of like open information, what type of balances are out there. Again, that can all be done from a, at a click of a button, as well as looking for, as a dashboard just for Gabriel Solutions. So you'll notice I've actually drilled down now. On the left-hand side, specific, that dashboard that we spoke of it at the CFO level can now be looked at from a Gabriel Solutions or a customer level. So you'll notice we have demographic information on the left-hand side and key performance indicators specific to this customer. So sales information, pipeline information, outstanding balances, as well as things like you know support tickets that may or may not be open. Um, we call this the 360 degree view of the customer and it's very valuable. So if you think about things like your sales reps that might, might want to be reaching out to their customers, it might be a good idea to come out and check their dashboard. So if there's an open P1 ticket um, you know, with some type of issue with that customer, maybe it's probably not the best time to be going to look for an upsell. Okay? So again, the same idea here is from this global CFO perspective, I have that ability to access a lot of different information just at the click of a button. Um, again, keeping in mind things like this roll-up from a, a global P&L um, uh, perspective, it's real-time. So if we entered another transaction in another subsidiary, whether it's based in the you know, Europe or Asia pack or within the US, again, that rolls up immediately into this um, dashboard. Okay, so as far as just repopulating that screen, um, any type of information that's going to be loaded will immediately be um, loaded up into that um, key performance indicators. Okay. With that said, what I'd like to do now is step a little bit away from this CFO perspective. Now I'm going to go down into just a subsidiary, um, just for the controller of the U.S. West subsidiary. And for these purposes, I'm just going to enter a sales transaction. Okay. 
typically a controller may or may not be doing that type of thing, but again, just as far as what that person has access to, it's easier to do this from a controller perspective. I'm going to go out and actually enter a sales order into the system. There's a couple things to note. NetSuite has the capability, if you have a reseller network or a distributor network, to break out who the base customer is going to be, okay, or you know the end customer, versus if you look at some of this, we can go out to different sales channels, which are popular these days. If you use distributors or resellers, you have that ability to look at it across the board, okay? For these particular cases, I'm going to keep it um, where the customer is, is just a singular customer. Um, from a visibility vantage point, if you don't use a, a reseller or distributor network, we'll hide this. You'll have one customer and it, it'll be um, you know, invisible to most people. But again, the idea here is that if you have that requirement, NetSuite can fully support it. So you know, again, our customer base, multinational global organizations, as well as emerging companies that might have down to one or even possibly three users. Okay? For these purposes, you'll notice there's buttons available here for VSOE, EITF0801. We support all the latest revenue recognition guidance, um, if that's applicable to your organization. For these purposes, I'm just going to go out, enter a, we're in a software environment here, so I'm going to actually go out, enter a software license, going to enter 50 of them. You'll notice it's selling for $2,000, calculates that to $100,000. $100, One of the things to note as we enter this information, attached to these individual software SKUs are various attributes. So a billing schedule is attached. In this particular case, that license is going to be paid up front. So again, from a billing perspective, we're saying that this is going to be invoiced at 100%. From a support perspective, I'm actually going to go out. You'll notice that this dollar amount is showing up as zero. We've actually calculated out support at a percentage of that license. Okay, so for these purposes, I'm going to go out and actually enter, you know, for revenue recognition purposes, support is typically going to be recognized over time. Okay, so I'm going to actually go out here. We're going to say this license is going to be recognized immediately, build up front. The support is actually going to be build up front, but from a revenue perspective, it's going to be recognized over the next year because it's an annual contract. Okay? As I go through that, I'm going to save this transaction. You'll notice that the support now has been calculated out at a percentage of 25%. And again, that's the environment that we're in. Obviously, individual businesses can actually have you know, support at, at whatever calculation that you'd like as well as just if it's you know, per license basis and you want it to you know, add $2,000 per license for support, that's available. Again, I mentioned earlier there's a powerful workflow engine built into the system. So in this day and age, um, there's a lot of oversight to revenue. So again, there can be an approval process built in. For these purposes, I'm just going to say that we set this up appropriately and I'm going to have that approval process done from a controller perspective. Um, you know, for various accounting guidance, a lot of times that may be, you know, obviously a different person, but in the interest of, of demo time, I'll keep it short and sweet on this case. One of the things to note now, the sales order has been approved. It's now pending billing. But you'll notice now um, that revenue recognition schedule is now calculated a schedule. So I'm going to actually open that up. And if I pop this into another screen, you'll see now that that support contract, we've got a pre a um, pre-calculated revenue recognition schedule coming into play. In this particular case, we have it broken down to a granularity of exact days. So given that we only have a few days left in the month of November, again, that's going to calculate just down to the last few days of November, calculate out on a daily basis. So December, January will be 31 days. February, depending upon if it's a leap year or not, will calculate that percentage. And then on the back end, next November, it'll have the remaining 26, 27 days of revenue. Okay? Very powerful tool there. Again, this is a, from a software perspective, but if you have a traditional brick and mortar manufacturing environment or a services organization, fully support it as well. Okay? From a billing perspective, again, I'm actually going to go the next step in this process is to create a bill okay, or an invoice. Again, I have in this particular case a, a billing of 100% up front. If there's some type of billing that's going to be recognized over time and it might be a, a monthly environment or somebody needs to pay 50% up front and then you know, pay in an installment, that's fully supported as well. You'll notice all this information carries over. 
Um, out in the center of the screen here, from a, a genealogy vantage point, you'll realize that this invoice is being created. It's invoice number 548, but you can see that going backwards that it's been created from sales order 2563. A couple things to note, you can actually drill back from these pieces of information, um, as well as from a data entry vantage point, no need to enter all of this information twice. You just press that button and it'll actually calculate based on these pieces of information. Again, keeping in mind as part of this prospect, before this invoice goes out, if somebody on the financial side wants to adjust the T's and C's, um, maybe give them a discount, something along those lines, this is an editable transaction, okay, until we actually save this transaction. In this particular case, I'm going to save it and print it and give you a brief idea of, of what an invoice can look like. You can obviously make them a lot prettier from your vantage point, but from these vantage points, you'll see that it's you know, we go out here, we're going to see that perpetual license, the support has been calculated out, okay, various components. If you wanted to put notes at the bottom, such as, you know, um, offer a 2% discount if it was in 10 days, or then, you know, 2% net 30, something along those lines, fully supported within NetSuite, okay? Now that we've actually went out, you'll notice that that invoice has been generated. Um, if I look at this more action screen from a GL impact, there's no need to actually go out and post to the general ledger. At this vantage point, we went out there. You'll see that it's been posted to accounts receivable. The, uh, in this particular case, that license is going to be recognized immediately, so that'll be posted to a revenue account. But then the support contract will be recognized over time, so that's being pushed out to the balance sheet. Okay? These are, again, just the accounting rules based for this particular organization. But you'll notice as I went through this, as far as picking accounts, picking whether it was deferred. That was all driven by the individual item SKUs that we sold. So while it can be overridden, you know, things like the billing schedule, the revenue recognition schedule, from a control perspective, typically we're seeing most of our companies having that driven from an item perspective, and the system will actually drive, you know, various components, whether it be from a billing perspective, revenue recognition perspective, or general ledger perspective. Um, it's kind of transparent to the user unless it needs to be overridden, okay? And then finally, probably the, the most important aspect of this is, you know, now that we've actually went out, we've created that sales order, we've invoiced them, now let's go out and we'll just show you very briefly how to accept money, you know, one of the all-important things, okay? Since I accepted payment off of that individual invoice, you'll notice it defaults to the ABC company, since that we pulled it right off of that invoice, you'll notice that the information is going to default, that they're going to pay in full, but we do support partial functionality. So if we wanted to go out here, for example, and say, okay, maybe they only paid 50000 up front, that can be overridden. Okay, you'll notice the payment amount changes. Depending on how you want to have this treated, it can be put into an undeposited funds account, meaning that you know, maybe there was a check mailed to the company, but it's sitting there and hasn't been deposited in the bank. If you want to have that be a two-step process, you have that ability. Um, also, if you want to just sit there and say, okay, look, this is just going directly to the bank, or perhaps it's being done through a lockbox function, you have that ability as well. And then again, you can determine, I've made it that I wanted a requirement that how we were paid. So whether somebody happened to show up with 50000 in cash, probably unlikely. But for these purposes, you know, you can actually go out and, you know, force somebody to enter how they were paid as well as putting things like a check amount or check number into the system, okay? Now by posting that again, you'll notice we have that cash application happening. So again, same idea that we mentioned previously. You'll notice the transaction, what's happening, the application has happened for 50000 The original transaction is out there so that you still realize that there's 75000 available. And then again, looking from a GL perspective, you can actually see, again, somewhat transparent. You have the ability to go out and look at it at any point in time, but you don't have to actually go out and grab all of that information um, unless you choose to, okay? For that vantage point, you know, one of the ideas there is that you can sit there and, you know, set up a workflow process if you choose to, okay, which can actually make sure that somebody actually goes out and does an approval process, okay? So again, as part of that process, you can determine whether you want to, you know, look at this. And I'll, I'll open it just briefly to kind of show you, okay, that there's a powerful workflow tool underneath this thing, the system. So things like, 
you know, when I mentioned that intercompany journal previously from the CFO perspective, we've set up a workflow transaction basically saying that, you know, individual country managers, for example, um, you know, they can suggest intercompany transfers, but obviously maybe somebody somewhere along the way there needs to be somebody with oversight for both organizations. Um, things like a PO approval process. Okay, if I pop that open, you'll notice just various things like, you know, as things are pushed through the system, we've got a workflow process for purchase requisitions, saying that somebody has pushed it through. It's a project manager um, that has the first level of approval process. After he's approved it, we sequentially have a controller that's going to approve it. Again, powerful from that workflow perspective that you can actually determine who can do what. And then even, you know, we talk about, a lot of times people look at workflows just from an approval process. The workflow manager within NetSuite actually is much more powerful than that. Things like, in a, you know, we were just talking about doing collection processes and, and how people were paying up front. Well, it's always not that simple. In this particular case, we've actually driven a workflow process that drives behavior. So things like if, you know, something happens where, you know, people haven't paid initially, the system can actually drive what the behavior will be, okay? In this particular case, if, you know, an invoice is 30 days overdue, we might send out an immediate invoice or notification through email just saying, hey, look, you may have forgotten to pay, you know, this is a gentle reminder. If the dollar amount's a little bit higher, it can be treated a little bit differently, all the way up to sitting there, you know, depending on if, if things start to get to 60 days or 90 days, maybe the system can create a, a somewhat more aggressive email or even prompt, you know, somebody internal to create a phone call up to including putting the customer on credit hold. So again, that workflow process, while we, it, it's traditionally thought of as an approval process, it can also drive various behavior within the system. So, you know, up to including where we started talking about invoice collections, where it can, you know, generate invoice or dunning letters as reminders, up to and including putting people on credit hold. Hopefully that's the worst case scenario, but again, that's just a process where, you know, we can drive that if necessary. Okay? So just kind of talking at a, at a high level, giving you an overview of, you know, that global organization being able to get information out of the system. Um, I think we touched on that. We touched on a, a brief sales order process, you know, going from a process to an invoice to cash payments as well as cash collections. Um, at this point, I'd like to almost turn it over to a Q&A because I think we have approximately 10 minutes left. And so, John, I don't know if we've gotten questions out in the queue. Uh, yeah, we've got a handful of questions here. Let's go ahead and jump into those. Um, also, of course, if anyone has uh, any questions right now, uh, feel free to um, to add them using the question section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Um, so first question up, uh, Rob, can you tell us a bit about licensing as a monthly, quarterly, annual, per user? Um, also, Fran had mentioned something about sort of, uh, I don't know if incidental users, but sort of not power users, um, you know, how is licensing different for people who are just using the system for um, entering POs, et cetera? Can you give us the overview on that? Yeah, sure. So primarily, it's a license-based model. So um, how pricing typically works is you will sign a one-year contract, and then you pay on a monthly basis. Uh, you know, you pay as you go, basically. Um, for the fee, so you'll pay an annual basis and it's based on your monthly fee per your licenses. So there's a flat, a flat, a basic flat fee uh, per company and then on top of that then you have license fees per the number of users. Um, so if you have 10, 10 folks working using the system in the company, you're likely going to pay more than if you have five folks in the company using the system. The nice thing about the SaaS model is you could start with three people and then as you deem it necessary to add more, then throughout the year you could add more or the following year you could add more folks. So, and it's relatively easy to, you know, uh, add more people or change in future years as well, so. And uh, the opposite of that, of course, is subtract. Is it easy to subtract people yeah. as you're going? Definitely. And um, in terms of features and functionality, do you get the entire enchilada? Um, you know, what about revenue recognition capability and others? Sure. Are there sort of add-ons, extra, et cetera, how that work? 
Yeah, so there's a, a core, there's a few different uh, a, a few different systems up front you could choose. There's NetSuite Financials, which is the core financial product. There's NetSuite, which is the complete suite, which includes uh, CRM, so sales, marketing, service. Um, E-commerce is another part of that suite, is, of course, as well. Um, and then there's uh, a CRM module, so it just focuses on your typical CRM parts of the product. Um, and so you could choose to... Uh, only implement CRM if that's relevant to you, um, and that's where you want to start initially. Um, and then there's our One World product, which is particularly for global and multi-company organizations where you require uh, the, your local organization, let's say you have an organization in um, Australia, that if you want them to see their reporting in their own currency and the such, in their view, and yet at headquarters you want running a completely a different system with their own perspective and views, um, you'll use a one world solution. So that has its own price point. So it depends a little bit on uh, your business need and the modules, but the core product that most companies will start with is NetSuite, um, you know, with a focus on financials, of course, um, and then they'll, uh, you know, add additional modules. Revenue recognition is one of those pieces that is an additional module, and there's a few other additional mod modules depending on your need. But the nice thing is you can always start with NetSuite, and then as you need those other modules, you can add them initially or at a later point. So it's fairly flexible. The system's built as one complete uh, database in the stuff, so adding modules um, or subtracting modules for that matter are, are a relatively easy process. OK. Uh, another one for you, Rob. Um, what size uh, or sizes of business uh, do you target for NetSuite? Well, like, is there a best fit? for not sure, in terms of size, or we might as well hit industry while we're at it. Yeah, sure. Uh, so in terms of uh, employee size, it does depend, of course, on businesses and and specific industries and the such. But generally speaking, most of our, our companies, our customers, are 20 employees and above. Most of them are uh, approaching or at at least $5 million in annual revenue and above. Um, so you know, it's usually at the point where companies are most companies are using a system like Sage Peachtree or QuickBooks um, when they get going, um, and usually it's it's at the point where the companies become a fast-growing company. They have uh, pretty strong growth aspirations, um, and once they've gotten to that mentality and they know that they want their business to, you know, grow consistently, become a, a larger business, more like a mid-sized business, that's where QuickBooks really just can't keep up, particularly with, you know, on-premise piece and with you know, a bunch of other siloed systems that slow down the business. Um, mm -hmm. And that's typically when they kind of make the call and look to NetSuite. The, the other thing I'll touch on is that global companies or multi-company organizations who have a few different subsidiaries or operations in multiple countries, or for that matter, have currencies operating across multiple uh, regions, those types of kind of global multi-company organizations oftentimes uh, will switch to NetSuite because we're uh, our functionality is pretty much more robust than any company, um, unless you know there's a few companies like that, like SAP and Oracle, where you can use their systems for that. But that usually comes with a million dollar price ticket. So, um, so those are the kind of the typical scenarios when companies move to us. Um, fast growing companies, 20 employees or above. A lot of our uh, companies are 50 to 500 employees um, in that range. Um, and then we have a, a good smattering of some smaller companies that are 10 employees, 15 employees and such, but they happen to have a pretty strong uh, annual revenue and order transaction volumes. Um, and so they, they just need a system like NetSuite to keep up with their, their volume and their uh, growth requirements. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so it depends a little bit. Okay. Uh, next question for Fran. Um, and I know, once again, there's no uh, absolute typical installation of NetSuite, but Typically, how long does it take to um, uh, to get a company up and running on that switch? Um, you know, sort of average company, 100 employees, um, you know, maybe operating in a few uh, countries, kind of thing. Um, how long does that take? Yeah, John, you're right. Our, our professional services team would choke me if I gave you an absolute number, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think we see a, a good majority of our customers getting up and running, you know, within the, the three to four to six month time frame. 
and that's typically on a on a part time basis because we realize that people have their day jobs. So um, we can get people running a little bit quicker if necessary, but obviously it's a joint effort between either our professional services team or one of our partners to help you get up and running because we'll provide the NetSuite expertise, but we also need um, you know, folks on our customers end to provide the specific expertise of how they run their business to, to make NetSuite run most effectively. So again, you're right, there is no tip, um, typical implementation, but again, that's kind of the time frame. If you are a very large global organization with many, many subsidiaries, it might take longer than that just because of the level of complexity, you know, as part of that implementation. Yep. Um, and it sounds like uh, you guys work um, both in a direct mode with customers as well as through resellers, is that correct? Hey Rob, do you want that or do you want me? Yeah, sure, I'll take that. Yeah, yeah, we, we have a pretty robust network of resellers. I think it's 250 plus at this point um, around okay. the country um, as well as direct. So. Um, it, it really depends on your preference. You know, if you, for example, go to netsuite.com and uh, fill out one of the forms for a free product tour, um, you're, you're able to um, to request a solution provider on that form if you want. Uh, if not, typically you'll work with a, uh, a sales expert who's dedicated to your industry and company size. Um, that's how we organize our sales force so that, uh, that you get the most relevant uh, person that would understand generally how businesses like yours operate and their needs. Okay. Um, another quick question, uh, probably for Fran here. How well does NetSuite uh, communicate and integrate with other systems? If you're you know, more than a 20-person company, chances are you've got some legacy systems, maybe you've got some other new cloud systems. How easy or difficult is this to, um, to manage integrating all of that? Yes, yeah, so, so NetSuite actually provides a, a full set of tools to enable integration back and forth to systems because you're right, while we offer a full suite of applications, we also see it at various times that people have other niche offerings that they want to use that they do want to integrate back and forth. So, you know, I'm an accountant by trade, so the actual details of how that happens is, is probably left to some of the technical folks, but we do supply a, a full set of um, tools to get back and forth as well as our APIs are, are public. So again, we can go out and, and publish those if somebody wants to. Um, we can get you access to the actual APIs as far as the documentation of how that happens as well. Great. Okay. Um, okay. At this point, we're just about at the end of our hour. Um, we do have uh, another question or two um, out there, but what I'll do is I will uh, work with Fran and Rob uh, to actually do this one question in particular to make sure we've got that answer directly from the person asking. So I apologize. I want to be mindful of everyone's time here. Uh, and get us all out of here at the morning hour. Um, and so first off, of course, I'd like to thank uh, Rob and Fran for your time and uh, insight this morning. Thanks a lot for joining us and helping to walk us through uh, your platform. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, of course, uh, thanks to uh, everyone who attended this morning. Um, we appreciate your time and attention. And um, uh, we certainly uh, appreciate your visiting us at Performative, whether it's for events or online uh, in our community. Uh, just as a quick reminder, you will be prompted to take a short survey once this webinar concludes, which will be in less than a minute. Um, and the survey takes about a minute. Um, in that survey, we make it uh, just quick of a mouth, easy to request a connection with either today's speakers, and we're happy to help make that happen. Um, please join us again at performative.com and uh, continue the conversation. Actually, there are a lot of conversations about NetSuite uh, on Performative um, in the community there, and you always uh, should feel free to ask uh, other questions yourself. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, thanks to NetSuite for um, sponsoring this event and helping us uh, show the platform to uh, all of our interested users. Uh, we greatly appreciate their continued support. Uh, so once again, thanks to everyone. I hope you all have a wonderful week. We hope to see you again at Performative for another event or at performative.com. Take care, all. Bye now.